everyone. Um, this panel is uh, obviously made up of uh, people in the industry that have excelled in what they do. Uh, Bob, as an architect in Texas, has uh, done some tremendous work. Um, Kendall, um, as an interior designer in Canada, has certainly made her mark, uh, especially last night, winning an award. Another one, congratulations. Congratulations. And uh, DJ, who is an editor of uh, magazine, uh, Cottage Inn Gardens, as well as uh, being a judge in many um, award uh, competitions. So I'll start with uh, DJ. Oh. Um, I'd like to start with you. Um, obviously, you've been a judge for many different uh, competitions. Uh, can you talk about the importance of uh, using a variety of shots, capturing angles, and telling a story which each and every shot. All right, I'm gonna tell you a dirty little secret about design competitions. Most people, most judges, including me, look at the visuals and then read the copy. So if the images aren't great, you kind of have lost the judge before they'll actually go into the reading of what you put forth. So I would say that it's important to tell the story visually and then back it up with really concise information that's quick and almost bullet point uh, to tell the story. Keep it simple, clear, and really beautiful to look at. Uh, Kendall, how'd you like to c contribute to that? What can you add to that? Yeah, I think um, the, the images are the first impression. I actually haven't judged a competition, but I know that you know we spend a lot of time and effort making these beautiful images. So I understand how it's important that it's the first first thing you see. And for me, the writing is where I struggle the most. Um, you know, after you've painstakingly done this project, you don't want to write paragraph after paragraph about it, or I don't. Um, so I think that, you know, again, strong images and then focus in on the writing is key. And Bob, how, do you, how can you add to that? You know, the, the thing that I think is really important is when you submit your project for consideration, we do start with the images, but we look at so many projects, we're all knowledgeable. I actually start building the space three-dimensionally in my head based on the photos. Mm -hmm. So if things are just mm -hmm. a little off or if things have been moved, it, you know, it, it starts to make me, I either dig deeper into it or I start right. to dismiss it. Or you get frustrated. Yeah. You can't figure out the space. Yeah, and then from there, once you, once you kind of wrapped your head around what you're looking at and how it's built, because part of it is so many projects come in, they're all really great. So the, yeah. the nuances between why this one is a winner and this one was an almost a winner really can come down to the smallest of kind of considerations. So sometimes it's how the f pictures you have chosen tell the story and then how that story is supported in your narrative because if something just doesn't, click immediately, then I turn to the narrative to understand, well, why did they do this or why did they do that? So, it, but it does, it starts with great photography. No, absolutely. I mean, uh, photography is obviously uh, where it's at because as judges, uh, DJ and I were looking at all of the uh, entries this year and at one point it's almost overwhelming when you're flipping through everything. And as a judge, you're, you're quickly taking notes on uh, put an asterisk by this one, or this one is really special, let's not forget that. So, you know, imagine you have two days to try to whittle down from hundreds of, of possible winners down to three or four, and then kind of the judges all come together and we start having conversation about what did you love about this, or how many focal points were there here, <laughs> what made this so much interesting to you, versus how much I thought that was more important for me. And, and everybody has different ideas, but it's great because we kind of look at it and we kind of come to a consensus that, right. yeah, I mean, there's no egos involved because there's no money in the game. We don't know that, well, Kendall's, you know, project is in there. We have to make sure that we take care of our friend, but the truth but of sometimes the matter, we don't know who entered. No, we have sometimes no idea. Sometimes it's blind, and I prefer that. I don't want to know who it is, though, if you've been a judge, I'm sorry, I'm a talkative person. He's going <laughs> to have to shut me down. If you've entered a lot of contests and you've judged the contests like I have, I kind of know a certain designer's look, because everyone has a signature. And so I kind of zip it, but I kind of then judge you, was this your best one compared to the other ones I've seen? So it's kind of interesting. Um, so uh, Kendall, let me start with you. Um, how important is lighting when you're, when you're setting up your, your shot? Yeah, it's 
the most important thing. Um, in Vancouver, actually, we have a, a lot of rain, which we're known for. So um, the sunny days and that golden light and kind of that, you know, perfect natural light that the photographers are looking for basically doesn't exist for us. Um, a lot of the spaces we've had to shoot that were so dark on that day. Um, so I think it's about definitely making sure that you have the right time of day to shoot and then making sure that the photographer knows what they're doing to get that shot for you and really capture what your space is about. And Bob, how do you uh, feel about lighting? How important is that? Well, I have very hot opinions about lighting. Oh. Well, <laughs> share it with us. <laughs> so one of the things that um, when I'm reviewing a project that I hate is a strong word, but I almost want to use it in this instance. So when your photographers are taking pictures, they'll basically bracket it. They'll say, here's the best exposure we can get, but then they'll ratchet it down a couple stats and they'll ratchet it up. So, and then they'll bring it in digitally into programs like Photoshop and they'll get the perfect exposure for every single thing. So if this area is dark, well, they'll overexpose it and then take that part and put it in. And what you end up with is a perfectly illuminated space. And I'm here to tell you, don't do that. Yeah, don't. Don't do that because it takes the life out of the space. Yeah. And we know that, you know, for me, one of the things that makes photos so, what makes them do their job is they allow you to project yourself and your lifestyle into that space. And we can just take Peter's project on a screen. I mean, it's kind of fortuitous that this is the image is added up. I can see where the sun is coming in. I can see mm -hmm. the impact that the daylighting has on the space. It's casting shadows. It's really, really important that it's not, it doesn't look like a showroom photo. So I can tell you that as a judge, I react much more favorably to photos that are well lit, but look like how they would exist if I was in there having a coffee mm -hmm. than if it was studio lighting and everything was perfectly illuminated. Mm -hmm. I, I will go back to what Kendall said. In photography, at least in magazines, we actually love a great day because what happens on a gray day is that you have even lighting and you can fill in soft shadows. So I, I prefer a rainy day because I think oh, when you have high sun, you get glary lighting and it's, a, it's really hard to control mother nature through the windows. And so I would prefer a gray day any day. I mean, look at the British magazines, <laughs> their gardens, they're all done on gray, rainy days and somehow it looks beautiful yeah. Colors pop and it's richer. Yeah. Yeah, no question about it. I mean, I, I thought, oh, let's get a great sunny day. It's actually the opposite. Yeah. yeah. Right? You really want a cloudy, overcast day, so you don't have to worry about the sun, taking the shot now, taking something an hour later. Right. It's always going to be pretty consistent. Yeah. yeah. And even, sorry, just to add a little bit more, the um, knowing what space you're shooting, because if we're on the 50th floor of a tower yeah. and the sunset is so beautiful in that light, so it's kind of, you can pick your time of day, don't think it's all in the photographer's schedule. So. And then one other thing about lighting is, you know, your photographer should be able to shoot for the outdoors and then shoot for the indoors and then they sandwich it together. And that is like the perfect sweet spot of imagery. So Bob, um, as far as photography, what is the, uh, how important is the first impression when you, uh, when you take a look at photos and you're like, Immediately, do you know that's a winner? Or do you say there's a possibility, there's something that really strikes me that I'm not going to forget about this? Well, I'll tell you, when, when you know that you're going to be looking at a series of photographs, I like the first image to be the one that pulls all the information together that I can orient myself before I start digging into the next subsequent photos to figure out how I might move around the space. Because, you know, when, when, when I've judged kitchen and bath competitions in the past, I mean, we started having a conversation of, oh, that's where the coffee is kept. And that's how, like, how, how is the activity staged in that room? Because it's not just an aesthetics competition at some point. It becomes like, does it work? Is it functional? And is it beautiful? It has to be all these things. Again, we're talking such minor degrees of separation between first place and also ran. So the first image I like is the one that just orients me to the space. And then you can drill down as deep as you want on some of the details because there's a lot of designers, I bet this room is full of them, that do all these really clever, intelligent details and transitions. Mm -hmm. and, you know, yeah. and you can really play that stuff up because that's where it starts to show your skill because 
you're not showing this to a potential client. You're showing it to people that do it for a living. We understand it. We, we don't need as much narrative to get further down the field than you might think. So I appreciate big photos, and I appreciate lots of little, tiny, zoomed-in detail photos. Mm -hmm. And DJ, uh, how do you feel about that when you, when you see your shot, when we were looking at some of the photos uh, at, uh, in Hackettstown, and we looked at some of them and said from the beginning, that's a winner, right? Yeah. Kind of put that on the side. How about you know, the others? OK, how well, I don't always uh, go for the big We're going we're gonna to have a problem today. I know. <laughs> It's okay, architect. Want to sit next to her? I know. <laughs> Poor Kendall. Uh, sometimes, I know when we judge this year, some of the const uh, contestants would do a really tight shot as a first shot. And sometimes that gave me a lot of information, and that what, that's what drew me in. My only problem is when you start with a high and then the next image is not as wow, that's a problem. So. You got to be careful. That's, that's fair to say. That's fair to say. It's you got to be careful about the lineup. You know, in magazines, there's this thing that we call push and pull. So when you're designing your entry, you 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 kind of have to play with emotions in terms of the imagery that you're picking, because that's what always hits home with me. And I I sometimes like a detail that that tells the story. Um, and then other times I like an overall, but I don't want to see a fabulous detail and then the overall is like such a letdown. Sure. I think anytime we're talking letdowns, that would be a bad thing. <laughs> but I think that if you're going to bring a photographer out to shoot a space, how you organize the information if you're going to send it in for publication versus if you're going to... Yeah. Because there yes. might be a limit on the number of pictures that you can submit right. for the that's competition. Right. So that's an, another layer of consideration that needs to figure into it. Right. And that might help you prioritize how many overarching kind of storytelling narrative shots do I include versus, hey, I really like how this transition base detail at the inside corner by my sink works. You know, sometimes that shouldn't make the cut because right. you only have a certain number of images. And also it's right. costly. I mean, sometimes you're like, I can only afford this. And that buys me, what, four images from the photographer. So you really have to think it through. I think Kendall mentioned that you really need to go into that space before you have someone take a picture. I think it's really helpful if you take your iPhone and actually do yeah. some sample shots and then go back and look at what you shot. Because I think that you're, there's enough distance that you can see, are these images really telling the story I wanted to, to tell? Kendall, quick question for you. So talking about photography, how important is it to get a professional to take the shots? Oh, the <laughs> most important. Right. That was like uh, one of the early lessons that I learned was that the iPhone photo didn't count <laughs> no. for much. Um, and then also paying, um, you definitely pay for what you get. Um, at our firm, we have probably a, a different tiers of photographers that we use depending on the budget of the project depending on what we're going to use the images for. We definitely know ahead of time which projects will go to be submitted to anything. Um, so we, we kind of gauge what we're going to do based on, based on budget and, and what we need them for. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, we normally uh, take three or four uh, projects and we decide to earmark these for yeah. competition, magazines, our blog, uh, uh, social media, etc. So it's not just the contest. Mm -hmm. Remember, you're going to use this to build your portfolio. Mm -hmm. And in five years, you could have 20 projects that are going to blow people away. And that small investment of $2,000, let's call it, that can get you 10 times the amount in projects that come in because people see professional jobs at a very high level. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and people like DJ are looking for information like this all the time. So, I mean, her business is to find beautiful projects and put and share them with the world. So it's not wasted money. It's not just for a contest. Oh. Mm -hmm. You could segue that into many other things. Yeah, you can also save it for a possible book. So it's yeah. really it, it's really good and important to get full ownership of all of your imagery and make sure the photographer knows that and you sign a contract with them you want full ownership. So that means in five years, 
you have, let's say, 15 projects, you have a book. And so you really need to think ahead. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of people don't understand how this is the building block for your business. Even if you get started, you're early in the game, just take one professional shot and build on that. Because in years, I mean, I've been doing this now for 38 years, and my I've got four portfolios, and I break them down into kitchens and bathrooms and special yeah. projects and transitional and contemporary. So when people come in, I earmark exactly what they want and pull out that book so I'm not shooting and missing. I'm hitting every point every time they flip a page. And because of that, that portfolio that I've built throughout the years, it's really been valuable for me to build my business. So I say everybody out here too, it's not just for a design contest, yeah. it's much more than that. And I was gonna say, if you're gonna take that one shot that you're gonna pay for, do a nice big overall shot, because from that shot, we can gather smaller images from it, being a high res it. image. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I would say something. Yeah, I'm just kind of, I don't know if we'd have a chance to bring it up or not, but I was curious if you had the group up here had strong feelings about lights on or lights off in the photos. Ah, uh, the New York Times article. I don't know what you're talking about. All of our uh, <laughs> photographers prefer lights off. I will tell you that my feeling is with photography, whatever makes sense. If it's a dark room, a dark library, and yeah. you want to have, let's say, one lamp on, put the lamp on. I, I just think that it, it's stupid to put a light on if it's brilliant sun. Yes. You know, there are moments where it works, but I will tell you the trend now is to turn all the lights on. There was a trend in photography editorially when it was all the lights off. So I'm referring, so it's yeah. fickle. I think what makes sense to you is the right way to go. Yeah. I mean, we were talking about the wow factor and, um, when, uh, when you're looking at something, DJ, as far as a, a photograph, what do you key in on it? What are things that you say, wow, I'm glad they did that? Well, the image that's up right now, this was for a competition, that, a design competition that we run. And this was such a tiny bathroom. And so I'm going through it. And the first thing I see is the problems that this designer faced. There was a time restraint. There was a space restraint, and there was this issue that the homeowners did not want to open the powder room to see the toilet. So it's like, so how do you jimmy rig this so that you're not viewing the toilet right away? So I was taken by this because of the problem. So this is an example where the copy actually helped me, but I loved it because it was a tiny little space and there's a lot of design for a s small square footage. Now, obviously, we're in a day, we're talking about lighting, we're talking about a lot of people are into minimalistic design, etc. How do you feel about staging it? Minimal staging? Uh, put out the fruits and vegetables, cut the bread, put the cheese on the countertop. As, a, as an editor, when you're seeing this, I'm sure you've seen an evolution. Can you share that with us? Yeah, we used to overprop. And I got to the point that building a trough of vegetables and lettuces oh, in a kitchen, I was done. I'm not, I, no one eats like that. <laughs> and can I just say it looks dumb? Like no one would ever do that. I, did, I just always house. wonder what was the emergency where they had to run out and yeah. leave their Are vegetables half party? chopped? Yeah. <laughs> you know? And it feeds you after when you're done your shoot. Yeah. That's well, funny. unless you need it for the next shot. Uh, so true. Yeah. So I, <laughs> Again, I sound like a broken record. I think you should do what makes sense. I think you do need green or something that has life in a functional space like a kitchen because otherwise it looks dead. So whether it's a group of lettuces or, um, I don't know, a, a pineapple, I, whatever. But I, let's not build a trough <laughs> because it takes away from your design. Anything that takes the focus off of your design is ixnay, don't do it. Yeah. It should enhance, not take over. Yeah. Right, no, I, I agree, and I've been seeing that evolution, and our, my photographer obviously has cut back, I'd probably say by more than 50% on what was out before versus what's out there now. It's really about showing the architecture of the space 
and the lighting and the cabinetry detail, et cetera. So I just want to put that out to everybody. So you know, don't have to go to the food store with four bags of groceries and bring right. it in and say, this is a necessity. It's not. Uh, less is more, I think, in, in the way we take our photography. That's for sure. Um, what about um, detailing, uh, for example, ceilings? That's one thing that I see a lot of people overlook. Um, Bob, let me ask you about ceilings. Obviously, you're an architect, coffered ceilings, tray ceilings, et cetera. How do you feel about ceilings and their importance to a, a room, a kitchen, or a bathroom? Well, they're important in the sense that they need to be considered, but the design needs to reflect the style of the space. So I do a lot of modern work, and so it would be wildly inappropriate for me to put wood beams and coffers in. So. Yeah. Uh, I don't have strong opinions about it one way or the other, other than I just want the designer to consider that, is it an appropriate move to make? Is it not an appropriate move? Is it about the light fixtures? Is it about pendants? Is it about ornamentation at the ceiling? We're just looking for a level of consistency that you didn't, you didn't accidentally, like you didn't forget it. If it was the right move to do nothing at the ceiling, that's okay. Yeah. You know, that's not you know, an oversight. But sometimes it's an opportunity, it's a tapestry you could use, but you just need to use it in the right circumstance. Right. Kendall, how about you? How do you feel about ceilings? Yeah. Are they important yeah. to a design? I, I think the same. I think sometimes they're, they need attention and detail, and other times they can just be left um, plain if your floor is very interesting or, you know, like there's stonework, then those can be the features. I always say if everything's cool, then nothing's cool. So pick your battles on where you're going to have your accents. And sometimes the ceiling is it. Right. And DJ, do you see a lot of uh, ceilings being accentuated? Or how do you see ceilings coming into play on photography? OK, I'm going to say something. If you ever are on a shoot, I want you to flip the image upside down. Because I think that if you split a, a shot into thirds, there should be either even or um, a high-low kind of contrast. But it's helpful to flip your shot around and say, wow, there's a lot of, if, if the ceiling's on the bottom, there's a lot of white. Right. Is it that interesting where the focus, uh, the interest is in the center and in the bottom? I, I think it goes back to your design, what you're trying to do. I also hate when lighting fixtures are cropped oddly. If you have a pendant light and you're, the way you crop it, you don't see enough of it, I think that becomes annoying. So again, it's just like, where did you put your design elements? If you're a modernist, is the ceiling more of a, you know, a neutral, there's a not, not a lot going on, then maybe you crop it out because that's a lot of air in the shot. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, it's like when you dress yourself, think about top, bottom, middle, you know, it, there has to be a balance and if you've got way too much of nothingness, crop it. So I have a question for you, DJ. We're talking about, uh, we're talking about ceilings, et cetera. But um, I've been seeing a lot of and doing a lot of two tones, which you've been doing a lot of. But what about three tones or four tones? Have you been seeing more of a trend towards that? You know, obviously, the all-white kitchen is super sleek and sophisticated, but sometimes it could be a little boring, right? Now you incorporate maybe another material or two or some color or texture. Do you see that that's coming to the forefront now in design and what you're seeing coming through? Yeah, I think everyone had to figure out how to make white kitchens sing and not make it look like a medical lab because, honestly, the white cube can look like a medical lab. So how do you... How do you sexy it up. Well, you add texture and you add interest so that this way, when you enter the space, it feels warm, it feels en encompassing, and texture is like a color. So I think y you guys are the pros at using texture, so I say, yes, please use it. And I have seen gradations of colors, and I think it's really pretty if it's done well. Bob, how about you? How do you feel about textures and colors, incorporating them into enhancing a design? I think it's important when it's the design gesture that you're making. So, like, let's say that you're going to do a kitchen and you want it to feel warm, so you, you start considering some of the warmer woods. Rather than defaulting to a rift-cut white oak that has a very 
strong linear pattern to it and it's very consistent, what if, like if you were to compare that to saying if you use like a pecan or a hickory, something where the wood has a lot of movement, there's a lot of tonal variations, wildly different kind of impact on what that space will have, but it can be, it can be very strong. And if you have one or two strong gestures, I think that's okay. When you, when everything is the celebrity in the kitchen, it's, I, I think it can be overdone. I think there needs to be some restraint. You need to say, this is what's important in this space and then really go for it. Like really go for it. But don't say, this is gonna be amazing and this is gonna be incredible and this is gonna be the greatest thing you've ever seen. And the next thing you know, like you were saying, if everything's great, everything's then nothing's cool. great. Then it's everything's nothing. Cool. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's like I'm not a big fan when somebody using uses natural stone and they just cover everything. And I go, it's like wallpaper. You might as well not have right. it anymore. Yes. So you want to pick your moves. So texture, it's good. Just be thoughtful about it. Mm -hmm. right. And Kendall, just saying that, uh, obviously there's a possibility that people can overdo it, right? Can you just elaborate on that a little bit on... You know, when is, when do you say no mas, this is it, this is yeah. good enough, let's leave it alone. I think, I'm, I mean, that's our, my job as a designer every day is, you know, the client is a little bit more, a little bit more, and it's our job to kind of tone that back. Um, but again, I think, you know, with your wood grains and, you know, with the use of concrete and the use of tile, I mean, there's a lot of ways to add texture that doesn't have to be purple or blue, it can right. still be white and kind of just soften and harden the space. Um, but yeah, everything, everything cool, nothing's cool. So. No, absolutely. Now, let me ask you a question since you've won a number of awards, right? <laughs> when you walk into a space, do you say this is the potential of being an award winner? Do you have that moment and do you share that with the client and say, this is an amazing space, mm -hmm. let's have some fun with it and get this to the next level. Can you share that with us? Yeah, um, I definitely, it doesn't usually happen right away. It's kind of once we start talking about what they need and want in the space. I mean, if they're talking about including a lot of technology in the space, because that's what, you know, seems to be a trend. And they're talking about using higher end materials that we know we'll be able to push the limits of. Then we kind of start to clue in that, you know, this is, this could be one that, you know, we could possibly enter. Um, but I think, you know, it has to be in the comfortability of the client. I don't do a lot of incredibly high-end homes. So it's, it's all about kind of finding that perfect sweet spot with the current clients that we have and picking our, picking our battles. And some people are incredibly private and never want their space to be photographed at all. So right. we have right. to watch that as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, we've done a number of projects where the client comes in and right from the get-go say, says, I want you to design an award-winning kitchen for me. And what does that mean? Uh, well, it means, yeah, well, it's, I don't, sometimes eyes. I don't even know. <laughs> I haven't even seen the space, right? Eyes. And I'm like, okay, yeah. so there's the bar already, you know, what do you do with that? And uh, sometimes they're willing to throw as much money as they right. have into it to get it to that point, because <laughs> money can get you things that maybe uh, you can't buy with a lower budget, right? So, uh, so that does happen. And if a client does say that to me, then I say, well, we can do that as long as you're open to some things and we're going to push the envelope. And I also tell them you have to come out of your comfort zone yeah. because you may not say that purple is your favorite color, but that may be a great uh, match to what's coming into the room that'll be exciting that the judges will look at, right? Because being a judge and, and, and DJ understanding that you're looking for something like a pop of color, right? Just doing vanilla may not cut it, so you may be looking for that orange or that purple or that pink or whatever it may be, just to put it on the front cover of that magazine and say, this is gonna sell, right? So I always use that approach to say to the client, listen, this may be out of your comfort zone, but I think this could be amazing, yeah. and if you do wanna you know, enter this and maybe do something with it, this will give us a better chance of maybe being a winner. And they get excited about it. I mean, clients, some people, you know, like you're saying, they just don't want to have anything photographed in their home. DJ has seen it a million times, I'm yeah. sure, right? Can you share some of those stories? Like, I did a great kitchen, but we yeah, can't photograph could, it. Yeah, there are a lot of places I would love to get into, but <laughs> because the homeowners are very, very high end, very, very private, you know, it's not odd for a designer to take me through a project and do this. I'm like, what the hell is this? They're like, DJ, 
it's all sound. You're being recorded. I'm like, okay. So uh, we're, and they, the artwork that they have is incredible and blah, blah, blah. And it's beautiful ho homes, but that doesn't, oh, can I just say the amount of money you spent does not equal great design sometimes because I think that they did one, two, three expectations. And yeah, they went to, for the highest appliance and blah, 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 but it, A, it doesn't reflect them. B, the overall design leaves me cold. So I don't think throwing money at a project always gets you the results you need. Right. Sometimes with a lesser budget, you're actually more innovative because you're forced to come up with solutions That's right. that are more organic. And we usually hear, can we get this project published versus can I win a design competition? I think that that's because yeah. in, in the client's eyes, it's not about uh, the trophy, it's about the magazine and the pretty pictures. Really? Well, you know, I don't, almost, my clients. I don't almost say that the, uh, the really high-end, super fancy ones don't appeal to judges as much as the other ones because we appreciate, like even the bathroom you were showing earlier, it was very small, it was tight. You instantly look at it as a designer and go, I can understand why this was successfully done because look at the challenges they had to overcome. When I see giant blown out kitchens to where they just backed up. Too much space. And I go, anybody could have done this. Right. And that's not, to, that's not really true. There's some hyperbole in that, so forgive me, but, but some projects lend themselves to just going, that's amazing and clever, and there's lots of little amazing details in it, as opposed to just these big, like, you could tell they could do whatever they wanted. They're very nice, but I don't get as enthusiastic about what they had to do to create this environment as someone who clearly had some space challenges or some other issues right. to deal with. Mm -hmm. So, um, obviously, the photography is always very important. Uh, but the design statement is also what we go to right. as judges to say this is going to tell the judges what they're looking at in better detail. Right. So they see a beautiful ceiling or a painting or whatever it may be, and then they need an explanation for it. So, DJ, can you just elaborate on that a little bit? Well, I go to the um, written information for two things. If I like a project, I, will, I honestly will go to see the amount of money spent. Because going back to everyone's point, like if they had a ton of money, I'm like, okay. Mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't lower it in my, in my mind, but at the same time, going back to what the panelists said, is that if it's big and there weren't obstacles that they had to deal with, it's always easier. True. Versus someone that had to like really think out of the box and test their design skills, that kind of project really appeals to me more. Mm -hmm. So I do use the, the written part of the entry to really kind of, as you said before, dig a little deeper if there's something I don't understand. And I will say if it's a crazy layout, it's really worth do doing a floor plan because that has saved a couple of projects in my mind. Because if you don't understand the space and then you see a floor plan, you kind of, you instantly understand it. Yeah. And I think you're then more agreeable to going further with the project. Yeah, absolutely. Bob, how do you feel about uh, the, uh, the statements? I mean, I know when I first started entering some of my projects, they would be these long, gigantic, you know, that never stopped. I mean, I'm sure that the judges looked at it, probably rolled it up and did a hook shot from the corner somewhere saying, I can't deal with this. Uh, and then probably about five or six years ago, I just started using bullet points uh, just because, you know, it's fast and furious. You know, as judges, you just have to get through it. What's next, what's next, give me information so I can make a decision. Is it in this pile or is it in this pile? So how do you feel about it? Do you think the bullet points are the best way to approach the de design statement or do you have another thought on that? I do. I, I like bullet points because the, the reality of it is, so I think we've all been a part of the same judging panel at one more time or another, and I might review 150 projects in an eight-hour window. Right. And I just can't read everything. So you start skimming, and you're just trying to extract what the good information is. And the number of times when I read something, I go, what, what does that even mean? Like, right. why, that has no value to right. this here. 
And I, I will say that I think the, the, the statements are the hardest part to do it because I'm going to talk out of both sides of my mouth because on one side, I want bullet points. I want it short, sweet. Get, get me the data that's in, that is valuable. But on the other hand, I do like, I do like a story. I do like to yeah. understand. And there should be a personality in the narrative. And sometimes yeah. I think everyone nukes that personality. And sometimes I prefer that because it is, they're yeah. telling a story. Yeah, because it's designed for a, a person. And I wish that the narratives when they were put together were more like two people sitting down over a beer or a coffee or whatever it is, just talking about it rather than it's, I feel the same way about this like I do with mission statements. People say things, you go, well, you should have been doing that anyway. Like the owner had a tight budget, so we had to be really clever with our solution. <laughs> oh, duh. Of course yeah. you should have been clever. Yeah. So there's lots of things like that that they don't add any value. And it's the whole, my worst flaw is that I try too hard. Those are throwaway kind of comments. Right. And I think that if you get rid of the throwaway comments of things that people would expect you to be doing anyway, you kind of end up with, just the narrative part of the story and just the bullet points. Right. And I think that's the sweet spot. I mean, I will say that in magazines, we have to tell a eight feature, an eight-page feature in 450 words. Now, that should tell you how you got to <laughs> pull it in because no one has the time because we are going through it. But I think what happens to me in the process is I put the, uh, projects in I like, I should, I should look at that. And then I'll go back and resort. And I think all of us do that. We're like, they're classic, yeah, I love this. I don't know, that's kind of interesting. So we, we do pre-sort and mm -hmm. then we go back because there's certain words and words are really important. And please don't use cliches like, you know, that word lifestyle, I could kill myself if I read it one more time. Okay, nuke that word, please. Yeah. I, 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 you know, I, I just think that you know your client, tell me something about the project, tell me the problem, tell me the solution. And, and I don't know, it's, you gotta just personalize it, but don't go into, don't write a novel. Yeah. Keep it short. Yes. Kendall, what I, I was yeah. going to say how I would approach writing it as typically I write the bullet points out first about the project and then the next day I add all the fluffy parts yeah, yeah. to it and then the next day I reread it because it I'm just not good at this and then I'll often even go to magazines or websites to read someone else's story so that I kind of get in the world of telling a story because I do, like I said at the beginning, I find at the, by the time I've got to this point and I'm writing this paragraph, I'm so tired of this project Yeah, <laughs> that You're I have nothing like super nice sometimes to say about Here's it. Here's what's simple. That's the honest truth. Open it up with, tell me what you're going to tell me. And yeah. your last line is, tell me what you told me. It's yeah. very simple. Yeah. yeah. And I'm going to start writing the struggle. That's what I'm going to do. No, the struggle. Keep it simple. <laughs> no budget. A problematic yeah. client. Yes a lack of time and dealing with, you know, whatever. I, I think those are the things I look for. Yeah. And sometimes this is really interesting. If you get a really quote, a great quote from the client, but don't say, oh, we love it. I know that they paid you. We know. <laughs> Give me something else. Exactly. And that's an easy way to add a little personality to it. I mean, I think that uh, less in this situation is more because none of the judges want to read three pages of how you put this together. So I think it's make sure that the important things are touched upon. Yeah. Uh, for example, this was a structural wall and this was a solution. Right. That's really important to us because we're like, wow, there was some ingenuity involved right. here. They had to get an architect, they had to get an engineer and That's look right. how they solved this problem. Right. That gives you a lot of points compared to someone just had a beautiful, perfect room and they just kind of filled it with cabinets, we kind of say there was a problem and look at the way they solved it. Right. That was genius. Yeah. But, and also make sure that the pictures match what you say. If you say, oh, the client is a, loves to cook or whatever, and you show me 
something that doesn't reflect that is kind of crazy to me. <laughs> a trough. Like a yeah. trough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that would Great. work with a cook. So I would have to think of something else. But sometimes if they're in mm. obvious opposition, I'm like, what the hey? Yeah. Which client are they reflecting in these pictures? Sure. Sure. You know, and then obviously there's three parts to the design contest. The photography, which is obviously important. The design statement was important. And as designers, we need to be able to provide the proper floor plan and elevation. And we ran across a bunch of them that were just beautiful photography. And then they, they missed center lines. And they didn't put overall measurements on it. And they had two out of the three details. So, um, again, try to be responsible enough to kind of go back to your books and say, I need the overall measurement, I need the center lines for the windows and the appliances. Right. So, don't overlook that. I mean, not that that's super, super critical, but if it does come down to second and third place or third and yeah. fourth, yes. guess what? If you didn't put all of that nomenclature down properly, you're going to be fourth. You will not take third. Right. So, we do look at it. It's not super, super critical, but it is important when you start putting everything together at the end. And yeah. how do you feel about that, Bob? How hard do you think that really is? Well, as an architect, I take the drawing part really seriously because uh -huh. I think that's the craft of what we do. Right. Mm -hmm. Part of it's the visioning, but if we can't articulate what's in our head in a way that can effectively be communicated to the people that build it, then I go, you're, you're, maybe this is not really your strong suit. Mm -hmm. But it also tells me, and this is a... I might be stepping in a little bit right here. Oh, go for it. All right, let's do it. <laughs> it's almost over. Go ahead. Yeah. So I know I'm going to say it, and, and I'm going to run seconds. away. I'm going to run. So I'll look at the drawings, and sometimes we have a comment that we'll say in our office, like protecting the client from themselves, right? And, and we try not to say no to people. We say, yes, that's a great idea. Here's what that means. And then in, when they go, ooh, I don't want to do that, then it's right. their idea. Yes. I, I look at the drawings sometimes, and I think they're so bad that – all the people that worked on this job protected the designer from themselves. Like, this is good not because the designer was, had their A game out. It was because they worked with a really good millwork company or they were, had a contractor that said, you know what, that actually needs to move over four right. inches. And so when the documentation does not match the finished product, that's a huge red flag for right. me. Definitely. Have but then there's the some package. little things that we notice, like plugs near water. It's like, whoops. You know, they're basic things that are safety issues. I was like, really? Right. Well, uh, actually, outlets you know what over connect? sinks. And yeah, I want to ask about that. So what about Photoshopping out stuff that are practical in nature, like, like outlets in the of end course. wall of you, an island? You get rid of them. Yes, <laughs> they just Photoshop those. And the thing is, is I struggle with that actually a little bit. I go, the reality is there's an outlet right there because I see it in your drawings, but then there's not one... I mean, maybe if I'm, it's a pretty outlet, fine. If it's an ugly one, you nuke it. You got to get rid <laughs> of it. Come on. But I go, that's the difference between a I publication like photo and a design because you go, yeah. isn't part of the design challenge to figure out where to put that outlet so it's not in the end of the island? Yeah, no, I, I totally get that. But right. some of them are pretty and some are really doggy. <laughs> and sometimes when you're doing renos, like you're, you know, yeah. adding stuff to an existing space, so you've got icky lots of things. Can't, or not, or, uh, what is it? <laughs> Wall acne, we call it. Really? Wall acne. Really? I don't know what that is. And then we take them out and Sounds the like a shop. disease. Is that, I don't know, texture? No, Spackle. just a lot of switches and plugs. Uh, and uh, not uh, oh, yeah. It's a busy wall. It's no, just a busy no, wall. No one wants yeah. to look at that. So, so let, me, let me ask uh, one last question before we wrap it up. Um, Kendall, you've won a number of design contests. Uh, how has that affected your, um, your business? You're, the way a client looks at you. Um, well, and she's again, a star. She can charge more. Of course it's helped. There you go. That, that would be good. <laughs> so how have you had, I mean, obviously you're, you, you use that to your benefit in a nice way, but, sure. you know, without overpowering people with in their face kind of thing. Yeah. But tell me, tell me how that's affected you. Yeah, I mean, I think any recognition is good recognition. I think this industry is, is incredibly difficult to get recognized in. So any of those kind of little wins or things that you can share in your email signature or on your website, I mean, that all helps your marketing and your branding. Yeah. Um, I think that our work definitely is geared toward a, a certain type of clientele. And they're, you know, happy to see that we have, you know, 
those things under our belt when they, we come into their home. So I think um, people should keep applying, and I think it's a, gr it's, it's a great way to, if you don't have a huge portfolio of work, to add those little extra things in. Yeah, it does help. Can I add one thing real quick to the people who are, if you, get, if you take one thing out, I would say if you submit for a design award and you don't win, keep trying. Because, yeah, definitely. Because every design jury panel has its own personality, and we definitely influence each other. And so if this group thinks your project was not worthy of a design award, it doesn't mean that another one won't. Right. So if you feel strongly and you're passionate and you believe that you have a really good product, submit it more than once. That's a valid point. Also, remember, you're being judged against the group that's entered that year. Yeah. So remember that. If there are four, 45 white kitchens and you're not number 46 white kitchen, it, it's going to be a harder battle for you. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think at the end of the day, all of us being judges and, and being designers, it's really important that you enter your, your projects. I would enter them every year. Whether it's five or whether it's one, I would definitely enter it because, again, you're just honing your skills, you're putting yourself out there, you're being recognized by your peers, right. and you're also sharing that with your, uh, with your customers, saying, I entered this in the design contest and I won, or, or you know, we got, we got honorable mention or whatever it may be, but now your client says, this is the designer that I want to be working with. I want that person who is out there at the forefront. So um, I think our time is up. So thank you to the Thanks panel. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Everybody have a great show.